This program is brought to you by Emory University. This is our first symposium, uh, and we truly hope that it becomes an enduring tradition throughout the years. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the NACD for partnering with us and for all of their help and support. We wouldn't have been able to do this without them, especially Mr. Aguilar. Um, and now you'll hear a few words from Ruben Gutman, uh, who's the founding partner of Gutman, Boschner, I butchered that, and Brooks, um, a plaintiff-based litigation firm out of DC. Uh, he is the f basically the founder of ECAR. Uh, he's the reason why the journal exists. Uh, and he's essentially, you know, our guardian angel, and he guides us uh, to make sure that we may, you know, endure and keep our mission the way it's supposed to be. Anyway, um, so he's going to say a few words about ECAR. Thanks. Uh, Lorraine has implored me not to go more than my allotted time, so for the first time in probably my life, I've actually taken the time to write something out. I will say that Commissioner Aguilar got, was probably the first speaker that Edgar ever had, and it resulted in Harvard University publishing a blog which specifically mentioned his comments, um, and they've gotten widespread attention. Um, by way of background, Edgar was founded in 2013. Its mission changed the focus on how we view and teach corporate law. From the Virginia and Massachusetts Bay Companies of the 16 and 1700s, which inspired in some sense our constitutional government that we have today, to contemporary multinationals with tentacles that stretch beyond geographic boundaries, corporations <coughs> touch the lives of consumers, employees, investors, and retirees. And as in the BPP oil spill, their wake of, the wake of their impropriety when it occurs can impact those without even an immediate connection to them. Corporations have the ability to aggregate intellect, raise capital, and spur innovation. We know that. Yet, as we know from Enron, WorldCom, Tyco, and an array of pharmaceutical companies that are now convicted criminals, individuals operating under the comfort of the corporate umbrella, perhaps to meet Wall Street promises or for the personal gain, can steer corporations in perilous directions. This is what former Deputy Attorney General Sal Yates observed in her September 2015 memo to line prosecutors known as the Yates Memorandum. The Edgar, the Edgar mission and our discussion today are about looking at corporations and their impact on the individual. We know that wrongdoing orchestrated under corporate cloak is not without individual victims, victims, and Edgar itself, of course, was founded after the last financial crisis, which was not without its victims. Edgar is, Edgar is both about corporate governance and accountability. It is about how government can impact, be, how governance can impact behavior that presents as torts, economic frauds, and environmental harm. It is about harnessing traditional corporate law concepts like fiduciary duty and ultra-virus to enforce compliance with environmental and workplace laws and other regulations. Today we will start by hearing from the regulators, Louis Aguilar and Walter Jospin, and then we will veer off, perhaps, get into the weeds and look at how corporations, corporate behavior impacts various constituency groups. We will have an array of experts in their field, including one of the foremost environmental and consumer law scholars, Bob Percival's, Percival, and Lorenia and her staff at the Corporate Governance Group have really put together a terrific series of panels. We are pleased that our group today is small and congenial. We are pleased to bring those from different viewpoints together. Perhaps my <coughs> comments this morning are a little bit provocative, but hopefully they'll spur some discussion. We look for your participation. We want robust dialogue and discourse, and the disagreement that is the cornerstone of rigorous analysis. So thank you for being here. Uh, this is a new journal for us at Emory Law School. It's just a few years old in comparison to the other ones, which are much older. And we hope that you're, you become part of the Edgar family and contribute and attend many more of these. And hopefully, we'll see some of you making contributions to our publication. So thank you. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? I'm Linda Welty. I am uh, chairman of the 
uh, National Association of Corporate Directors, NACD Atlanta chapter. We are honored today to be partnering with Emory Law in this first of its kind uh, symposium on corporate governance and accountability. NACD, for those of you who may not uh, be familiar, is a recognized authority on corporate governance. It's a nationwide organization of over 18,000 director members, uh, over 400 of which are uh, residents here in the greater Atlanta area. NACD Atlanta, the Atlanta chapter, produces programs monthly uh, to give our members insight on critical and emerging uh, governance issues facing boards, advancing excellence in corporate governance, and just helping our members lead with confidence in fulfilling what is becoming an increasingly complex uh, role. Two of our uh, esteemed speaker panelists today are themselves members of our board of the Atlanta chapter of NACD. They are uh, Luis Aguilar to my right, former commissioner of the, of the SEC, uh, who served under two presidents of uh, two different political parties, and uh, Eric McCarthy, who will be joining one of the panels later on. He was my predecessor as chairman of the NACD Atlanta chapter and a former Coca-Cola executive. Um, both these gentlemen have served as corporate directors on a number of, of corporate boards, both public and private companies. Um, we hope that you'll take away from today's program some key insights on uh, the increasingly demanding and, and complex role that's played by corporate directors in protecting the interests, not only the long-term interests of shareholders, but also the broader long-term interests of all key stakeholders, including customers, employees, communities, and, uh, and the environment. So on behalf of NACD, uh, welcome to today's symposium. I will, at this point, turn it over to our two uh, uh, SEC uh, experts here today, uh, Walter Jospin and uh, Luis Aguilar, and I'll allow the two of you to, to elaborate a little bit more on, on your backgrounds joining us today. So thank you both for being here. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you, Linda. It's uh, very nice to be here. Um, I have known Luis Aguilar for a very long time. He and I were actually staff lawyers together at the SEC in the early 80s. His office was next door to mine. As Yogi Berra might have said, I knew Louis Aguilar long before he became Louis Aguilar. So, um, our goal this morning really is to give you some sense of what goes on at the SEC and what you can expect from the new commission. Also, we'd like to give you our thoughts about what we've learned, what are best practices, and also what not to do as directors or as lawyers. Uh, we've seen mistakes and we've seen good things happen. Um, what we'd like to do is at the end we'll, we'll uh, reserve time for uh, questions. But if you do have a question and it strikes you at the moment, uh, raise your hand and we'll answer your question. If you disagree with us, you know, we like this to be interactive. That's more fun. We're going to be interactive. We have some things we want to talk about. We may go down some rabbit holes. We'll go back and forth. We want to have a good time. But more importantly, we want this to be interesting for all of you. So we we'll hope you'll jump in. Thank you. Uh, let me just add my uh, gratitude to be asked to be here. Let me add my gratitude to the NACD and Emory for coming together to do this. As Linda mentioned, it's incestuous for me. I'm part of the NACD Atlanta family. I'm part of the Emory Law Advisory Board. And in fact, uh, if I may modestly say, I'm one of your Emory Law 100s, uh, um, which is, I don't know how I became an Emory Law 100, but uh, somebody had to... Uh, uh, be blind, but glad they selected me. Uh, I hope we do this annually. That's the plan, uh, and so I look forward to it. Uh, I want to give a particular shout out to Lorena Lopez, who is in the front, who is the third year law student, uh, editor currently of the uh, EDCAR, and instead of focusing on studying and passing her exams, she focused on doing this. I hope it works out for you. <laughs> Uh, I, I really do. I want to thank uh, Reuben uh, 
uh, Gutman for all that he does. He's a class action lawyer, so undoubtedly he's either already suing one of my companies or will at some point sue one of my companies, and I hope that he'll at least be gentle, at least spell the name right if you can. Uh, and, and of course, I'm glad to be here with Walter Jospin. We, we knew each other when the pictures and the materials would have actually been jet black hair. Um, sadly, well, at least we have it. Uh, sadly, we no longer have jet black hair. Uh, but uh, he and I were in the salt mines together and strangely enough, uh, started our careers that way and both sort of, we're not through yet, but we've kind of retired from nine to five. And so our last jobs were at the SEC. So I'm looking forward to today's dialogue and I'm glad to be here. Thank you, Luis. Um, let me start out. Um, I think that it's a mystery for most uh, civilians exactly how the SEC is structured. Um, you know, what goes on, what's the role of the uh, <coughs> commission, um, how's the sausage made? Would you give us an overview, please? Uh, well, Walter, and uh, like all sausages, it's ugly. I, uh, I ended up, <coughs> excuse me, I ended up being the eighth longest serving commissioner in, in his history, and as Linda said, only one of two to be nominated by two different presidents from two different political parties, which makes me uh, as rare as chicken lips. I think I've, there's only been three in the history. Um, and I still don't know how the SEC does what it does. Um, the SEC, just to understand where it comes from, um, came into existence after the Great uh, Depression of 1928-29, um, when at the time there was no federal regulation securities, in fact, strong opposition to f federal regulation securities. So they um, uh, passed the Securities Act of 1933 Act to f at least allow public companies to make public disclosures because up to then there was none. A year later, they decided to create the actual SEC. And for those history scholars, the reason the SEC was created was because Congress was looking for a weak, inept agency. They currently the initial regulations were, man, were uh, uh, overseen by the Federal Trade Commission, who at the time was com full of what at the term was, at the time used was new dealers, people who were tough on regulation. And so Congress decided that that wasn't going to work, so let's create a more weaker agency. Uh, so they created the SEC. I think that plan backfired, uh, but that's how it started. And our first uh, chairman of the SEC was the um, Joseph Kennedy, the father of President John Kennedy, who at the time had a fairly good reputation for being a bootlegger. Uh, and in fact, uh, federal uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, when he appointed um, the first chairman, said famously, his words, not mine, hire a, cook, a crook to catch a crook. Um, but uh, uh, Chairman Kennedy actually brought a lot uh, uh, to the commission, starting from scratch, uh, we were actually followed up by another chairman, uh, William O. Douglas, who became a Supreme Court justice. Uh, uh, and so the, the SEC then you know, took on. It was created to oversee the key market participants in the capital markets, public traded companies, broker dealers, securities exchanges, investment advisors, and the like. Um, the SEC, to give you a sense of what the current numbers look like, and I've got a cheat sheet here because otherwise I can't really remember it. Uh, current picture, 20, late 2017, 2018, the commission is overseeing 72 trillion with a T in securities trading annually in the U.S. Uh, equity market. It oversees the disclosures of about uh, over 8,000 publicly traded companies, of which over 4,000 are actually listed on exchanges. Uh, it regulates activities of about 26,000. Reg registered entities, including 12,000 registered investment advisors, managing trillions of dollars, uh, nine to 10,000 mutual funds and ETFs, also with uh, billions of dollars, 4,000 broker dealers with 160,000 branch offices throughout the nation, uh, over 4,000 transfer agents, um, 10 credit rating agencies, uh, 21 stock options, uh, stock and options exchanges. Uh, seven to ten clearing agencies, slew of others, just to give you a feel. The SEC is also responsible for the oversight of a number of agencies you've uh, heard of and probably didn't think of. When I went to the SEC, I actually, uh, and I'd been at the SEC with Walter, but when I got there and they told me we also have oversight of these entities, I said, really? Um, they oversee FINRA, which of course you could expect. FINRA is a financial uh, regulatory authority that itself oversees the Broker-Dealer Commission, uh, the community. 
Um, they oversee FASB, Financial Accounting Standard Boards, the group that determines the standards for accounting for all, uh, not only public companies, in the, but really all companies in America. The Municipal Securities Rulemaking Board, which is in charge of the fixed income market, which is actually dwarfs. Uh, the equity market is much smaller than that market. Uh, and of course, newer agencies like the Public Company uh, Accounting Oversight Board that came into being under Sarbanes-Oxley after Enron and everybody else showed the auditors weren't doing the job they should do. So that's the SEC. It's not just the public companies. It's just not really the enforcement arm, which I have not even mentioned to now, which is how everybody knows us. When, when you read in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Washington Post, that some companies just paid bill, you know, millions and millions of uh, uh, penalties. Uh, officers and directors have been barred from the industry. Um, uh, they, you know, subject to injunctions and the like. Uh, you know, so it's it gives you a sense for it. The SEC, on an annual basis, um, does about two to three thousand uh, examinations and investigations, mostly of regulated entities, but also of companies to whom a dime has been dropped. I know inflation's got it down to a quarter now, but that's still the saying. Where somebody has called, given us a tips and complaints, told us to take a good look at a at a company. And, it, it, and so, you know, so that's a lot of what the day-to-day -day of the, uh, the staff is. They uh, also do, I don't know, hundreds, hundreds, close to 1,000 enforcement actions a year. Uh, and if we do, we do, I say we, uh, the SEC does that with 4,600 4, staffers, relatively small. Uh, and we were reading in the paper about the new VA uh, change at the VA. There's an agency with 160,000. So uh, the SEC, for all the power in the, that it gets, it does that with a very spirited, uh, committed, passionate group of staffers uh, that, that make the whole thing go. Uh, so, what, so what, what was your day? Tell us about the, uh, what your job was. Yeah. The commissioner does vis-a-vis -vis the chair, what the day-to-day. -day, I mean, this is a big list of duties which are handled by uh, 5,000 employees, right. which is pretty stunning juxtaposed against the VA. Yeah. So what do commissioners do? Commissioners do everything. Uh, and I, I don't mean to be uh, that whimsical, but uh, there's five commissioners, just so you know. Uh, at, per law, at no given time, more than three can be from the same political party, and usually the swing is who is the president. Uh, if it's a Republican president, you usually have three Republican uh, not necessarily Republican appointed, but, but, but three commissioners that are viewed as Republican, two that are viewed from the other party. Um, but because we're a commission, not a department, we're not like a secretary of the treasury, we're not like a department. Really, the commission is these human beings. And so all the staff, the, the, the client of the 4,600 staff are these commissioners. Uh, each has a vote. We're uh, independent agents. Uh, I'd never worked for the chairman. Chairman never worked for me. I have, uh, I, and it's true of every commissioner, have taken public stances against the chairman, even if uh, the supposedly your own party, um, because we're independent agents. Uh, we, uh, you know, obviously rely a lot on the staff to help us do these things, but ultimately what we have is one vote, uh, and that's the power that commissioners have. We actually get to vote on just about everything the commission does. Every enforcement matter that's brought up goes to the commission. We get to say yes or no, please pursue. When it gets to the settlement stage, we get to say yes or no, please settle. Uh, we, over the years, because five human beings cannot do all that I just listed for you, we have delegated powers to our various heads of the various divisions, of which there are five major ones. The Division of Corporate Finance that oversees the disclosures of the public companies, Division of Trading Markets which oversees the stock exchanges in the broker-dealer community, Division of Investment Management which oversees the investment advisor community and the mutual funds and ETFs and the like, and more recently after the 2008 crash we created a division purely of economists to help us uh, work through uh, the numbers that, to, that underscore a lot of the impact on the capital markets. Um, so that, and each of those has uh, their own offices underneath. And the only other major division to mention um, that's not the division but ought to be is OC, the Office of Compliance Special Examinations. They're really the ones that most of our regulated entities see walking in through their doors. 
They're the ones that come in on a regular basis, kick their tires, and try to figure out are you complying with the laws or not. Um, so uh, because we're a commission, uh, every decision flows through us. Even when they act under delegate authority, there's a provision in the law that says that we can take any action that was taken by delegate authority and force it to go through a commission vote. So when a director of a division is thinking of approving something and they're concerned that some commissioner may not like it, they usually run it by us just to make sure because they don't want to be embarrassed because the, when they hear that we've objected is when it's public and that we have disagreed with one of our directors. So it's something they try to avoid. Uh, and so our day-to-day, -day, um, long-winded, but our day-to-day, -day, you know, what are my eight hours a day consist of? It doesn't. It's usually 10 or 12 or hours a day. 16 hours yeah. a day. Uh, you, know, you have to understand my, my tenure. You can, you can time anything worse uh, than my tenure, uh, yeah, or maybe better from one per perspective. I swore in July 31, 2008. That's when I became a commissioner. And commissioners, you're either, you know, you're not pregnant and then you're pregnant. The light bulb is not on, then the light bulb is on just like that. You can get some information before you come to, before you become a commissioner, but when you become a commissioner, they literally walked in my office with stacks, stacks of papers uh, of things that I was now privy to see, things that from enforcement matters to a number of other things. Uh, very daunting. So I'm, I'm spending my August trying to figure out where the restrooms are, uh, how does one act as a commissioner, and then, you know, you walk in some, uh, mid-September day to find out that Lehman just went bankrupt, which is a surprise because for those who followed it, the evening before, the chairman of the SEC, God bless him, good friend, Chris Cox, uh, publicly stated on all the channels, because there was rumors that Lehman was going to go bankrupt, Chris stated, my staff just came in there, we've looked at their numbers, they're as solid as they can be. That's the night before. Next morning, it was Chris who walked to my office, you know, God, gee whiz, Lewis, uh, these guys of Lehman have filed bankruptcy. Can you believe that? Uh, and that started a series of events, which I won't get into, but Lehman went bankrupt. Uh, there was concern that other companies may go bankrupt, so the mutual fund industry, uh, does anybody know how payroll gets paid in America, in large corporations? They get paid through something called the repo market. Short-term loans that they get mostly from money market funds that are usually only for 48, 24, 48, 72 hours. And that market ceased up. Nobody wanted to lend money because who wants to lend money to the next Lehman and not get paid? So all the money market funds, one broke the dollar, something that had only happened once in the history of money market funds. And all the other money market funds were hanging on by their fingertips. Uh, uh, and markets were ceased up. Short sellers started to attack every bank and financial institutions in America. We were under pressure from, uh, I mean, I was getting, you know, calls from senators, you know, uh, you know, twice a day. The SEC did something unique. We banned short selling for financial institutions, something that two years later economists said was the wrong thing to do at the time, but seemed to be the right thing to do at the time. So then, because the market ceased up, uh, fraudsters and Ponzi schemers could not get new money to support what they've been doing, and there were literally dozens and dozens, hundreds of these, but Madoff took all the oxygen out of the room because 50 billion is 50 billion. Uh, that's, that was my first four months. Then you read in the paper that the SEC is the most inept agency in the history of agencies, and it ought to be disbanded. And there was actually a Treasury uh, white paper that talked about disbanding the SEC, portion of it would go to the Department of Justice, portion would go to the FDIC, portion would go to CFTC. And I'm saying to because myself- Because of Madoff, right? That was why. Well, because of everything, because we, we, we stood up there and said Lehman was fine the evening before it went bankrupt. Uh, because of uh, Madoff having been handed to the commission on a silver platter by Harry Markopoulos, who came into the, it's all public, came in and said, here's the fraud. Here's all the papers that proved the fraud. And, uh, you know, and it was ignored. Let me say that Madoff was so scared that within my being there three months, he gave himself in. So don't, it's a joke that nobody gets. I was not to blame. 
If anything, I take credit that he saw me at the commission and said, my God, they're going to catch me. I should give up. Uh, the, uh, and so I'm asking myself, as a guy that walked away from a very successful practice, what the heck have I done? They're about to ask me to turn off the lights. And for those who ever go to a law firm, leave it and try to come back, good luck getting your clients back. Uh, that's just not in the DNA of lawyers. Uh, they, they've now become my clients. So, but to the SEC's credit, we realized that we had to reinvent ourselves. We realized that the internal structure wasn't working. We realized that the regulatory system wasn't working. We realized we weren't getting the kind of information we needed. And so the SEC you know, really went through uh, the most uh, you know, transformation and, and busy time that anyone at the commission can remember since maybe since the 1930s when the SEC was first founded. We reorganized, I won't get into the litany of it, there's actually uh, books that you can read about. We reorganized ourselves, we passed a number of rules uh, dealing with money market funds and what have you. And so, uh, you know, that's a little bit of the story to tell you that my time has not made as, uh, you know, as, as similar to the time of other commissioners. I was there in the eye of the hurricane, and that eye of the hurricane continued for about four or five years. First two years, we're having to fix everything. Then, of course, Dot Frank came around and said, here's 100 rules we want you to adopt. And right when we're in the middle of that, the Jobs Act came through and said, here's another 20, 30 rules we want you to adopt. So for us, it was a great job for workaholic. You literally are working 16, 18 hours a day. And because you've got so much rulemaking, uh, every lobbyist in town is interested in what you're doing. And so you know, they all show up at your doorstep. So your day turns out to be uh, you know, two or three, four hours of going through a stack of rulemaking, uh, two or three hours of dealing with enforcement matters, and then two hours of dealing with lobbyists telling you why you shouldn't adopt the rules that are on your desk or why you should uh, you know, water them down significantly. Uh, and so that, and basically that was in fact how my days went, Walter, for probably through about maybe 2014 when things started to calm down a little bit uh, because uh, we had adopted or at least proposed most of the rules behind us. Uh, but you know, in your world, uh, you know, it'd be interesting to your take on the enforcement side because uh, what I would say is the most constant in any commissioner's life is the enforcement program. Uh, literally, there's a meeting scheduled every Thursday at 2 o'clock where you go through 20 or 30 cases, if you're lucky, sometimes more, uh, of, of the enforcement program of, of, play, of people that should not have done certain things. Uh, and for a commissioner, many of those come from a regional office. Uh, and so you know, it may be helpful for you to give some insight, because I think I spoke about what the commission does, the way we're broken up and what commissioners do. But a lot of our work is actually done in the trenches. And we have 11 regional offices that are important to the SEC's success. And you ran one very successfully. So you may want to give some insight sure. into what your office did and maybe the things that you did that made it as successful as it was. Um, to give you sort of context, you know, there's, there's a DC office, the home office, and 11 regional offices, and they're around the country. The biggest offices, as you would imagine, are in New York, Chicago, and LA. The other, uh, the other eight offices, about 115 staff. 90% of which are lawyers, accountants, uh, examiners, and analysts. Uh, very educated. Uh, my lawyers came from the best law firms in the country, the best law schools, and it's a good job. I mean, these, I call them kids. Um, you know, uh, uh, some are not kids, but the work is interesting. They go against the best law firms in the country, and they could have control over their lives, and they can make a nice living. Um, but each, uh, each office in the region does the exact same thing. You have enforcement, and you have examinations. And enforcement is what you imagine it is. It's investigations and litigation with respect to securities violations. In Atlanta, we have a bankruptcy. We. Uh, I think it'll be a while before I stop saying we. <laughs> um, Atlanta has a bankruptcy group. Uh, 
of enforcement has about uh, 60 lawyers and accountants. And then the office has examinations, which these are highly trained accountants and analysts, and they go out and they examine uh, wealth managers, which are investment advisors, and some broker dealers, uh, securities exchanges, and, and other registered entities. And they can't look at all of, of the investment advisors because there's so many of them. So, they're, so they have a risk analysis, or rather a risk analyst who determines really where the risks are. For example, an investment advisor is advertising 100% return year in, year out, or 10% return year in, year out. That is a risk, the red flags go out. Um, and and they, also, they also examine the wirehouses and because of complaints or the, just a routine examination once every number of years. And uh, those, ent those groups work together because exams learn about uh, violations and refer them to enforcement. My job was I supervised, I was the top line a supervisor of enforcement and examination. I was not in, in the weeds all the time, but the most important matters, I was in the weeds. Um, I also worked with a lot of uh, the local uh, law enforcement, U.S. attorneys, state securities commissioners. I was in charge of those, um, of those relationships. One thing to keep in mind, if the SEC is investigating, you have to assume that the U.S. attorney is involved too. Um, historically, the U.S. Attorney in Atlanta wasn't all that interested in securities violations, which is kind of hard to understand, but there's a U.S. Attorney there now uh, who's extremely aggressive, wants to make uh, cases, so there's a nice relationship. Uh, the office has relationships with uh, Nashville, uh, Charlotte, the big uh, commercial centers. So you have to assume that the U.S. Attorney is involved in every matter. Uh, they may not have an interest, but at least they're going to have a look-see. Um, what I did was, it's sort of like your job. I walked in the door. You really have no visibility. And I was in a law firm for 30 years, and I felt like you know I knew what I was doing. Being in the government is a whole different kettle of fish. I only managed 115 people. I don't see how this uh, physician is going to manage 110,000 people at VA, but that's another issue. Um, the SEC has a union for non-management employees. The union, I think it's called Opt Out, so it covers everybody whether or not they um, pay dues. Um, they are well compensated, good benefits if you look at somebody the wrong way, they will file a claim. So it took a while for me to get used, because in a law firm, if I look at somebody the wrong way, they'd probably leave the firm. Mm -hmm. Here, they file a claim against me. And so I um, got into the rhythm of things, moved some people around, so I think it was a better office. Sort of the mainstream lawyers were the same, but some of the supervisors uh, were different. But uh, we'll talk about this a little more. The enforcement cases are vetted substantially, so I felt like the SEC is extremely responsible when they do uh, uh, bring enforcement action. Yeah. Would you agree with that? I, I would. One of the interesting things, because enforcement, as I said, gets all the press. I mean, that's, you know, uh, that's, that's what makes the SEC's reputation for the most part. Um, and commissioners have both the most important role in the process and the least important role in the process. Ultimately, we're the ones that vote, okay? But we usually do not see a case. Commissioners usually not see a case until it is pretty much fully cooked. Uh, the people that are seeing the case from the very beginning are as Walter and people who work for Walter. They're the ones that when the tips come in, look at the tips, figure out whether it's legitimate or not, start an informal investigation. If uh, they're getting information voluntarily, great. If not, they get a formal order. At the formal order stage, it may be that the commission gets uh, a little bit of uh, insight, but usually is uh, a memo that says, we think all this is going on. We're not really sure, and we need subpoena power to go get it because we can't get it voluntarily. Who's going to say no to that? Formal order is that might be helpful. Formal order is, um, is a memorandum that the commission gets that, that, that asking the staff 
uh, where the staff is asking really for subpoena power, power to be able to subpoena and actually mandate that they get information. Okay. But usually the memo at that stage is we don't know a lot. They won't give us the information, and we need power to just get a subpoena to go get information. Who's going to say no to that? So usually they get rubber stamped. And then the, st uh, the staff goes out and gets the information. At that point, they'd start discussions with the potential target. And the discussions are everything from you're, you're bad people and we're going to nail you to the wall, or you, know, you could have done this better. Uh, the uh, Ruben uh, uh, probably goes, represents whistleblowers for the most part, so he knows somewhat the, the other side of this. Their lawyers will come in and say, ah, no, 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 our guy is like, you know, our guy is, uh, you know, he's as, he's as pure as uh, Caesar's wife. Could not have done these things. Uh, we heard that about Madoff. Uh, and so uh, that's usually a discussion being had, not by the commission level. In fact, when people want to bypass the staff and come to us, uh, there is a group of staffers from enforcement who will block the office, metaphorically. They won't let them speak to commissioners for two reasons. They don't want us to prejudge a matter, which is a problem because if we prejudge it, then we can't vote on it. And two, usually the information is not ripe. Uh, and so they have no, you know, so we don't see it at that stage. At some point they'll go through, maybe Walter can go through the process is, at some point we'll get, you know, it's possible the case may die because uh, ultimately the staff thinks nothing's there uh, or million and one reasons. We almost never hear about that. We don't hear much about the death of cases. They just, uh, you know, they, they go the way of MacArthur. You know, the, the generals don't die, they just fade away. Cases don't die, they just sort of fade away. Mm -hmm. So we hear about it when in fact they've developed enough information to be able to demonstrate that there's been a, a fraud or some violation of the law. And, and we get in a memo that's, you know, it can be anywhere from 20 to 150 pages, uh, you know, heavily footnoted. Uh, and we get that, and sometimes we get a Wells submission, which maybe you can talk about, which is really the, 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 the target's defendant's ability to say, this is why I'm not a bad person. And so we oftentimes make our decisions based on the paper. Uh, uh, we then go into this commission meeting to talk about, and this is, can be interesting because it's, uh, you should understand it's not all kumbaya. We can go, enforcement says, you know, Walter's a bad guy, you need to sue him. It could be the gen Office of General Counsel sits at the table and says, no, you're reading the law wrong. General Counsel weigh in on law, not so much the facts. You're reading the law wrong, he didn't violate any, anything because of this, that, and the other. We'll get a separate memo from the Office of General Counsel. And then if there's a division that's particularly impacted by the actions, let's, let's call it a, uh, a matter that occurred in the trading markets, and so the, trade, uh, the division of trading markets care, they may have a third view. And so they'll come in and issue their own memo. And sometimes at this meeting, usually enforcement's to our right, general counsel's to our left, and if there's a division that cares, they're in the middle, they're having a free-for-all. I mean, it's just buy some popcorn. Uh, it can be highly entertaining, except for the fact that you gotta listen because at some point they're all gonna look up in midstream and say, okay, what's your vote? Uh, and generally you can kick some of them down the road. Well, I need to think about all that I heard today, but generally uh, there's usually some statute of limitation that hasn't been waived or some other issue that says we either got to, you know, uh, fish or cut bait. Uh, so anyway, that's a bit of the process, but most of that starts uh, at the staff level, which the commission, uh, on 99 percent of the cases, is just uh, unaware of, doesn't even know what's happening, uh, doesn't see the wealth submission at that time. Uh, and if you're being targeted by the SEC, these are the people you got to make happy. These are the people you got to satisfy as to why you're not a bad apple uh, in the first instance. Not to say that there isn't room there for the commissioner, but it's usually, you know, if you're talking to a commissioner at that stage, you're probably already behind the eight ball. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, just to segue a little bit, um, cases come from various sources, tips and complaints, could be a self-reported by a company, by the way. The best companies, in my view, self-report to get uh, cooperation credit. We can talk about that later. Could come from newspaper articles. It could come from examinations. But uh, once 
an investigation has begun. And many matters, um, the investigation dies, either because there's lack of evidence, because it's a small matter, it's referred to the state. So lots of reasons why a complaint does not um, evolve into an investigation. But uh, what happens, so uh, the investigation takes place it, uh, uh, by accountants and lawyers, look at documents, examine witnesses. Um, once the staff determines that there has been a violation and they want to recommend enforcement, and that's a term of art, as compared to the U.S. Attorney's Office, which is very different. The U.S. Attorney does, does his or her investigation determines there's been a violation. He or she goes down the hall of uh, the grand jury and gets an indictment with no oversight from Washington, like that. SEC is very, very different. As Luis mentioned, there's an action memorandum that has to be written that is authorizing enforcement action. A senior officer like myself or like the division or the head of enforcement can't authorize a civil action. We have no authority. That the authority came from the, comes from the uh, commissioners. So there's a lot of energy spent on this action memorandum. It's uh, circulated inside uh, the SEC. Every division weighs in. The directors of enforcement weigh in. The commission. So, and while that is happening, the <coughs> staff gives a, has to give a Wells notice to the. Um, defendant or a potential defendant who gets to who gets to argue why they believe enforcement's not warranted. So all this is reviewed internally. It goes on for weeks and weeks and weeks. It's an enormous amount of work. There's an evidence review. It's vetted. Then eventually everybody agrees, okay, the memo is ready to go to the commissioners. Yep. And I would love to know what happens. I mean, obviously, I got to see outside, but from our view, you all have a lot of questions. The questions are different from the Democrats, from the Republicans, from the lawyers, from the non-lawyers. Yeah. Tell us what happens there, which I find really fascinating. Yeah. Uh, every commissioner, other than the chairman, who has a wealth of riches, every commissioner has really four attorneys that work for them and a confidential assistant. And we tend to divvy up the workload by the divisions. There's usually your, your investment management council, your corporate fin council, your trade and markets council, um, you know, uh, and so on. And they all do enforcement. I think that's, that it's not the way it has to be, but that's the way it's been for most. The enforcement uh, calendar is, is spread between them. So when the memo first comes in, they get it. Uh, they review it. If they find something in there that's a problem, uh, questions they have, they may come into your office and give you an early bird, uh, early warning sign that here's something that could be problematic. Uh, and then you have a discussion, hey, go get this more information, go get this, go get that. Uh, and, but, the, but the staff is really doing most of the work. Um, we tend to get action memos literally a few weeks before we're asked to vote on them. Uh, and the new commissioners, we'll look at those action memos immediately. The veteran commissioners, and by that I mean after you've been there two months, uh, you just don't, because uh, you find that you waste an enormous amount of time. Because uh, the calendar, the enforcement calendar changes uh, uh, with the tides. Uh, and so things that arrive that you're gonna vote on two weeks from now, they just disappear. They don't show up for another two months, three months, four months and you've just wasted a good hour and a half, two hours, three hours reading something. Uh, and so what most commissioners do is literally wait till about 24 to 48 hours to go. Uh, and then they do a deep dive, uh, and I mean three in the morning deep dive, until what you're gonna be asked to vote on uh, the next day at two o'clock. Not anything I really recommend, but, but it's at least cases that you have a 99% probability that it actually will not be pulled and you actually will get a chance to vote on it the following day. So uh, the process works a little bit for this reason. Uh, the SEC gets about a million tips a year, okay? And post Madoff, 
those are now uh, tracked. They used not to be. There's now the, the SEC spend millions of dollars in the system that makes sure everything gets looked at and that it just doesn't fall through the tracks. But because they get a million times a year, to some extent, the staff, some exceptions, can pick the best fraud they can find. Clear fraud, clear, provable, no questions being asked fraud. Uh, and generally, except for insider tradings that are easy, sometimes he said, she said, generally, uh, a blind, you know, blind, deaf, uh, dumb person can say, this is fraud. Uh, and so a good number of them just like a hot knife through butter, clear fraud. Usually there's already been settled uh, by the time, and, the, and we're actually being asked to vote on a settlement. There's only a smaller portion where there's actually legitimate arguments either as to what we think the law means, as to the facts, or the defendant is just not willing to settle. And so you tend to focus your attentions on that smaller portion, uh, commissioners personally because you're either authorizing to go to court, you wanna make sure you're, you're right about your positions, both in the law and the facts. And so uh, those are the ones that uh, we really demand that we get it a little bit earlier and you don't pull this. Because I'm about to spend time I don't have reading this and if you pull it, I'm not gonna be so happy when it comes back, you know. And commissioners have been known to, when it comes back three months later, usually the damage is already done, the money's been stolen, the people have been hurt, what have you. And you're just, so at the tail end, the staff will come back three months later after they pulled it once, and you caused me a huge pain in the butt three months ago. Uh-uh. I'm kicking this off for another two months, uh, you know. Uh, and, and generally, while the chair has more power than the rest of us, and the chair has to deal with the rest of us. So if one of us really wants something pulled, she has to consider how, you know, how much I want to take off Aguilar because he'll, you know, he'll, he'll, he'll make me pay somewhere down the road. So generally, they will agree with that pulling. And the staff knows that's because, you know, uh, I did that too. You were you because you're yeah. you, right? Yeah. Well, kind of. <laughs> um, uh, but, you know, it helps because it means, you know, in a world where you have more than you can do in a 24-7 hour day, you cannot have your time wasted. And so sometimes the staff needs to get a lesson that says, you know, I've got to be mindful that the, that the staff, you know, that the commission's time is premium. After all, I understand, the staff may have been working on the matter for years. They've had plenty of time to think about it, ask questions, go back. And they give it to the commissions, and if it's not one of these slam dunks, nobody could disagree. If it's one that's got a lot of hair on it, where the law is not as clear, the facts are not as clear, to show up and tell a commissioner with, three, four days to do, catch up on what we've been doing for two or three years, it really isn't fair. And commissioners will make an effort to catch up because we understand that that's important. But, uh, and I'd say 90% of the time we catch up, but there's that 10% where you just have to take, especially if there's been a, a you know, someone who's been an offender before, you know, this is the th second, third time you've done this to me as between me suffering and you suffering, let me tell you who's going to suffer. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, but that, that's a little bit of the way yeah. that Helpful. works. Let's uh, segue a little bit the new commission. Um, Jay Clay, well, actually, I think it's worth noting, and most of you know yeah. this, but the SEC is an independent agency, which means it's not part of the cabinet. So commissioners can't be fired, which is important, right? Mm -hmm. So, they can it, be impeached, but they can't be fired. And it takes an awful lot to impeach somebody in, in uh, Right, right. In, uh, DC. So uh, what do you see as an outsider, but even though you're an insider, where do you see this commission? There's a new chair. He's been there for a year. A couple of new commissioners. Where, mm -hmm. um, where do you see it going with respect to enforcement, Dodd-Frank, uh, and regulatory reform? That's a very good question, and I think we're running out of time. So no, actually, no, we're no, 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 actually, no, we no, we have. Well, I, I could have sworn I saw. No, uh, okay. <laughs> uh, uh, it, it's interesting. I mean, uh, every year, just you know, commissioners get a five-year term, and every year, uh, June fifth uh, of every year, somebody's term uh, lasts. Uh, they can stay on for roughly 18 months. It's not the way it works, but you can stay for 18 months in your grace period, and you still can't be fired. But during that period, a new person could be nominated. If they get confirmed, the moment they swear in, they're in and you're out. 
Uh, but in between, you cannot be fired. Uh, it, look, this actually, I was front page news in the New York Times and Wall Street Journal once because um, a guy named Volcker wanted to uh, talk Geithner at the Security Exchange Committee, at the uh, Treasury, to do something which I thought, and it turns out I was right, by the way, it turns out to, to create some, after the money market debacle, we did some transformation rules in 2010 to change it dramatically. Volcker, who never liked money market funds, thought they should all be banks, uh, came in and said, uh, they all need to be treated like banks. He talked Geithner into that. Uh, the, all this is public. Uh, the only time I actually was front page news on, on both those papers. Uh, they then came, uh, uh, you know, Mary Shapiro decided she was, uh, that, that that was a good thing to do. I then asked uh, to the economist, you know, tell me why the 2010 amendments did not sufficiently fix this. It's all public. Mary refused to allow them to do that. Uh, as luck would have it, and bad luck in many ways, my, my two Republican colleagues decided that the questions I was asking were good. I was a Democrat, by the way, so it was Mary Shapiro. Uh, they jumped on my bandwagon. The head of, and you can call him, he's now teaching at um, Vanderbilt. The head of DARE at the time came to my office and said, I can answer all these questions in two weeks, three weeks' time, tops. I said, well, why don't you? He said, she won't let me. And so, uh, I then said, well, I'm not going to act foolishly. You can't force me to vote. And if I have to vote, I'm going to vote no uh, until I get my questions answered. Um, I then, instead of getting my questions answered, get a visit. Uh, and I had to go tell the folks that you, you can't force me to vote. You can't force me to be reckless. And you know what? Try to impeach me, but you can't fire me. Uh, So dismissed. So anyway, where do you see and, things going with this commission? Uh, well, let me finish the story now that I'm in the middle of it. Sorry, <laughs> <clears throat> but uh, long story short, just so you know, uh, Shapiro leaves. Dear answers the questions. Turns out I was right all along. We still need to do a few things in money market funds, but it was not what Volcker wanted. Um, I tell that story for two things. A, I can speak in the first person. Two, to show you that commissioners can be in fact independent and commissioners do not have to do what the president of the country tells them to do. Uh, you're, 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 you're stupid if you're constantly at war with them, but you don't have to. We currently have five uh, commissioners. Um, they are, uh, two of them are two months old. It'll take them six months to really learn the tricks of the trade. Clayton's himself is only a year and a half long, a year and a half old. As a chairman, he really is a core fin guy, so he's probably having to learn a lot about enforcement. Uh, our makeup right now uh, is not dissimilar to the makeup that we had. Uh, it's safe to say we don't really have anyone who knows a lot about what the SEC does, and I don't mean to be disrespectful. Uh, I mean to say the following. There's no really working lawyers other than Jay, and he did that in the court fin. No one who's been in the trenches. We have people from policy side of the Hill, uh, mainly Hester, and to some extent Mike Pilwar, which is still there, although he's learned a thing or two. Kara also came from the banking committee, never really worked in, in, uh, in you know, outside. Both very bright, both very smart. I'm not trying to say they're smarter than I, and they've learned a lot, lot. but they don't have the well of experience and actual the trenches to be able to draw on. Uh, and so, you know, and, and Jackson's an academic, uh, probably knows it better than anybody else, but also ha there's a learning curve that you have to go through. So they're going through that. Uh, I don't think, until, until they have a firm footing under them, I don't think Jay's gonna be able to fully understand what he can get accomplished and not get accomplished. And so I think, uh, you know, you have to take the things that he said with the, you know, what he wants to get done almost with a grain of salt. Uh, you will go back to any chairman about things they consider to be their top priority that they wish to get done in the, in the next year that they never got done because they could never get the two other votes that they needed. Okay, so, uh, and usually you don't want to do it along party lines. If you can get a 5-0, that's where a compromise comes into play, that's where you don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. 5-0s are usually good. They usually don't get challenged in court. They, they, if they do, they usually don't get overturned. Can't get a 5-0, 4-1, not too bad. 3-2 uh, uh, that breaks along different party lines, also not too bad. A 3-2 along party lines 
invariably gets challenged in court, and there's a high percentage of those cases that actually get lost by the commission. So those are things that Jay has to think about. Um, I, I will say just quickly, because she really is getting ticked about her one minute. You may want to weigh that. People no, well, think actually, I made that up. I spoke to Linda, and Linda wants to have a little more time. Uh, so, uh, Linda. The, the enforcement calendar, <laughs> as I said, is what makes the reputation of the SEC. Uh, and I, and what the publicly available information shows is that the SEC is going to be more selective about the cases they bring, that they're probably going to bring fewer cases. In fact, the budget for this year takes away 100 lawyers from the enforcement division. And it's just simple math. Fewer lawyers, fewer cases. Uh, there's already going to be fewer penalties uh, in charge. And I think the, the, the broken windows regime that Mary Jo White initiated, that window where the dodo. So they're being more selective, but how they're going to select their firms, whether they're going to be more financial audit, whether they're going to be, uh, you know, most people think fewer insider tradings because that's never been favored by one side of the, the, the aisle, uh, you know, remains to be seen. So I, I still think you'll see a few enforcement cases. I think you'll see less controversial enforcement cases. The no-brainers will become the norm, which has always been the norm. But I think these cases that I talked about where there is, you know, a, a desire to extend the meaning of what a law is to try to reach an action that was not thought of when it was written into the law because technology and other things, have, and the evolution of the markets have made the law not as clear as it could be as a particular fact. I think you're going to see fewer of those. Yeah. yeah. Let's conclude with some stuff about uh, governance. Uh, I mean, this is a governance conference. Um, hey, I'm trying to. I'm trying to stop them. You? Well, no. This. This. Yeah. Let me just finish because this is to you. I think it's where people came. It seems to me. Is that okay, Linda? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. We have time for questions. Um, obviously, you over your long career, you represented boards, you were senior officer at Invesco and at the commission, you saw a lot of stuff. Um, tell us quickly what are some of the smart things you saw boards do that were helpful in the regulatory context, as well as some dumb things you saw boards do. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna be a little glib and, but, but truthful. Uh, you know, boards or directors that show up, have a cup of coffee, stay awake, and ask questions, uh, yeah, and show up prepared. It's really all, yeah, it's really what you want. Uh, and I say that, and that's changed, but for those of us old enough to be in boards 20, 30 years ago, there was always one or two guys who were sleeping through it. And, I, and I'm not even being flippant. There was one or two guys that were like, yeah, and like, you wake up, is it time to go? Uh, you know, God bless them, they were in their 80s and they were still kicking. Uh, but that was not uncustomary. I don't want to be flippant, but that was not uncustomary. Uh, that generally, uh, lawsuits, you know, the NACD, who's been a, a, a point to Linda because she's your chairman, and, and Eric was our former chairman. The, the NACD has been on the bullet pulpit about uh, directors needing to be informed, aware, active, asking all the right questions. And I think by and large, that's now the norm. So uh, the boards that I've seen that are good are those that, uh, you know, in fact are there, they're asking questions, they understand that there is a line between them and management, uh, if you will, macro versus micro, but that's not a line that cannot be pierced. Uh, boards that, are, that, you know, make sure that they set a good tone at the top, that they set good directions through um, to management that are communicative with management that forces management to be communicative to them as to the strategy that they want to take, why they want to take it, why of the various four things, they, four roads they could have taken, one road is better than the others, and those board members are there listening, informed, asking questions. Those tend to be uh, the, the best board, and they you tend to make the better decisions And what's good, even if they make the worst decision in, in the history of mankind, if they've gone through that process, they should be okay because there's no law that prevents you from being stupid. There, there's just a law that prevents you from being ignorant, perhaps, and laws that prevent you from ignoring red, red flags. So um, my advice to boards is read the material. Uh, you don't have to understand all the material. Uh, no board member knows everything. 
But if you don't, you have a duty to come in and say, gee, I don't understand that. Explain it to me. Yeah. Uh, what about exposure as a gatekeeper? You know, the SEC looks at lawyers and directors as gatekeepers. What have you seen where directors have exposure dropping the ball as a gatekeeper? Uh, I see it where either, That's the last question. either either when they've actually been somewhat asleep at the switch for the reasons I mentioned, or where they haven't taken the kind of care they needed to take to bring in the advisors that they needed, the other gatekeepers, a qualified uh, attorneys who know the area in which the, 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 that is being discussed, whether it's a you know intellectual property matter, whether it's a cybersecurity matter, whether it's you know real estate matter, you know if, if you bring in a, a stupid lawyer, you're going to get stupid decisions. Um, if you bring in a lawyer who may be brilliant but just doesn't have experience in that area, you're not helping yourself. Same thing with uh, auditors and what have you. Just make sure that the people that you bring in to advise you are the right kind of people with the right kind of skill sets and right kind of experience to be able to give you the best advice uh, that they can for you to ultimately make a decision as to which way to go. Uh, and there's a lot of gatekeepers that, uh, that don't do that. Those are the ones that the SEC tends to sue. Yeah. Because uh, sometimes the client cannot tell uh, how good an attorney or an auditor is. Uh, God bless them. Important CEOs have no idea whether or not they hire the right lawyers sometimes. Uh, most of them do, but I've seen some and you've seen some that don't. Yeah. Uh, I've had lawyers who like me. I've had, I've had CEOs who like me, wanted me to weigh in in areas in which I knew I was incompetent. And if I hadn't said I'm incompetent, you don't want me there, I'd have been giving advice and sending big bills and, you know, and taking us all down the rabbit hole. So it's important on the gatekeeper to sort of know their limits. It's important for management to understand those limits, and it's important for the directors to ask enough questions of the advisors to get a sense that it's the right person, the right firm for the matter that they need to deal with. Thank you, Louise. Uh, we love questions. We have some, sir. Thank you, Mr. Aguilar. I'd like to hear your thoughts on the current status and the future of the conflict. Uh, I'm surprised that hasn't been dead and buried already. Uh, I, I expect it to die. Uh, it was all, when, they, when they did Dodd-Frank, there was a lot of things that needed to be addressed and dealt with. Uh, Dodd-Frank did a lot of that. Ignored some issues. There's not a single thing about, I told you about the money market fund debacle that uh, resulted in the markets being seized up. You won't find the worst money market fund in the 2,000 pages of Dodd-Frank at all. Totally ignored it. Uh, but in other ways, it was a Christmas tree that everybody could hang, hang their best Christmas bulb bobble on. And so uh, there was three rules that in, the, in my wildest imaginations I never would have thought the SEC would have been asked to do with, conflict mineral being one, mining uh, disclosures being a second, and uh, what have you. Conflict mineral was uh, an attempt to bring, for all, for all the, for every side you're on, it was a tend to social engineer things going on in Africa, okay, uh, by bringing disclosure to it. And they said to the SEC, go do this. I, you know, I said at the time, you know, privately, but also publicly, in, in my wildest dreams, I never thought I'd get to be voted on this. But if Congress, who is the agency that passes the laws and of this country, says to an agency, you need to do this, and the, that rule was somewhat prescriptive, I don't think an agency should be an ostrich and ignore it. So the SEC, over a period of time, acted on it, barely squeaked by 3-2 the first time. Uh, a court found it to be, uh, too, went too far into First Amendment rights, uh, and so watered it down. And I, uh, and I think the commission said we're not going to enforce it for the time being. And I don't know currently what Jay's going to do with it. It's a hot button. And, and in fact, the number one hater of that rule is Mike Kapoor, who's still at the commission. So you'll have to talk to Mike what he's talking to Jay Clayton about. Yeah. And Mike's brought uh, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm reminded of why we miss you so much in government, both of you. Um, we have a lot of foreign students in Emory from China and Mexico and some are here. Um, can you speak to the challenges that the SEC has in enforcing compliance in the global economy, particularly with respect to investigating the FCP violations in China and other places? 
Uh, that's uh, you know that really is too technical for me to deal with, but I'll, 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 if you can want to. But I'll, I'll, the question is, how does the SEC deal with things in the global environment, uh, particularly FCPA issues? SEC jurisdiction is uh, pretty much limited to what goes on in the U.S. There was a case you can Google it and look it up called Morrison's. Uh, came down the pipes about three, four years ago, if I'm not mistaken, that talked about how the SECs can reach outside of the country. And it basically boils down to if the activity occurred outside the U.S. with respect to securities that are outside the U.S., uh, even if they came in and ripped off you know, me sitting here in Atlanta, uh, yeah, I may not have any recourse here in the U.S. I may have to go outside. But if, if they lied about a security that trades on the New York Exchange, then I got probably have jurisdiction here um, and a few things like that. So, so their ability to deal with some of those has certainly been watered since after Morris's, but that really is technical, uh, and so I would leave that. I would say that the SEC's most influence in that area is through arms such as IOSCO, the International Organization of Securities Commissions around the world, or COSRA, the Coalition of Securities Regulators of the Americas. I, I was the sponsor, uh, the U.S. Uh, the SEC's liaison to COSRA, so I'm very familiar with the Western Hemisphere. And there, they do view the SEC as the big brother. And if they're dealing with a rule, uh, and you think they will usually, you can usually talk to the group, to the powers that be in that country, and at least educate them about the various things they can do. And generally, they follow your advice, not always. But that, that it's an influence. It's a bully pulpit influence. It's no directional. You can't mandate them to do something. Uh, so that's where the influence is. But it's not that the SEC can tell the you know, commissioner of Brazil, you know, here's the rule we want you to adopt. That's right, what. and I agree with Luis completely. Um, my office, we sent people all over the world working with local securities commissioners in Switzerland and Philippines and China. Um, but as you mentioned, Luis, uh, decreasing resources, mm -hmm. you know, lost 100 lawyers last year by attrition and there's a hiring freeze. So that's much harder, but in the right cases, the resources are allocated. Yeah, I mean, you're gonna see the SEC doing what the SEC has always done. It takes an inside the ballpark view to realize they're doing X versus not doing Y. But for the most people, they're still gonna read the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, that the SEC sued this company and that company got this penalty. Uh, the, the, the people of the SEC are as passionate, hardworking, and committed as you will ever find, ever. Uh, the commissioners that we have, uh, you know, even though there's, you know, uh, some things I disagree with them are, they're all bright, they're all intelligent, they're all good friends. Uh, I, I take no issue that they're trying to do what they think is the right thing to do. I just may have different views as to what right is. But I take no issue that the votes that they take and the positions they take are based on uh, their well-informed, um, well-reasoned conclusion that this is the right thing to do. It's just in today's complex world, there are oftentimes more than one right thing to do depending upon how, which side of the bed you wake up in the morning. Anyway, thank you all for being a good audience. Thank you. Thank you, Luis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.